this is Tony for a minute to midnight.com and I have a short video here in which I want to show some things which I find to be contradictory and somewhat alarming and I am talking primarily about the push for technology for 5G on the one hand and taking us back towards the dark ages in technology on the other hand and this is driven by the United Nations religion I will call it a religion of climate change alarmism. Protesters have taken to the streets and scientists as well as climate activists have issued dire warnings about global warming. New Zealand farming put out this rather funny and yet at the same time not so funny meme the other day called the extreme green dream with these cavemen Okay, now we've reduced our emissions to zero, closed down our steel, aluminium and cement manufacturing, stopped flying, taken every truck off the road and culled the last cow. What's next? And no doubt that meme was largely as a response to this current New Zealand government's crazy zero carbon by 2050 policy which has thrown New Zealand farmers under the bus, will severely impact food production and also helps foreign corporations who want to own large tracts of land in New Zealand to plant massive pine forests and of course the carbon credit millionaires and billionaires will love New Zealand's policies as well. Farmers are warning the zero carbon bill threatens our ability to grow food as more and more productive land is converted to forest in a reverse of the land clearing policies of the 19th century. But there are signs of change as the economics of renewable energy, which comes from sources that naturally replenish, become more favorable. Investors are making money on clean energy, and many banks are rolling back support for fossil fuels. In April 2019, for the first time ever, clean energy supplied more of America's electricity than coal. Clean energy revenue, investment, and usage are all on the rise, despite the policies of the current Oval Office occupant. It seems clear to me also that climate change is a problem we can no longer be left to a future generation. I've made other videos dealing with what I believe is a giant United Nations driven scam, this man-made climate change agenda. In this video I want to just briefly look at some of the supposed clean green energy alternatives that we've been told we should be moving towards. Well just how clean and green and sustainable actually are they? And at the same time as they are trying to reduce carbon output they are also pushing us into a 5G world where we'll all be bombarded by electromagnetic frequencies across a wide spectrum. Now here's an article on Forbes.com from January 2018. More electric cars mean more coal and natural gas. The World Economic Forum documents the countries announcing bans on sales of oil cars. Ultimately, to put them on par, the success of electric cars will depend on continued price declines, especially for batteries, and installing an adequate range where far distances can be travelled on a single charge. But there's much more to the electric car story than what you might be hearing. The anti-fossil fuel business tends to forget and or ignore the fact that electric cars are obviously just that, powered by electricity, a secondary energy source that is mostly generated by the combustion of coal and natural gas, both here in the US and around the world. Electric cars often need an entire night to recharge at home, and they can increase a house's power consumption by 50% or more. Both in the US and around the world, for every 10 times an electric car goes to power up, it will be depending on coal and natural gas almost 6.5 of those times. Electrification of the US vehicle fleet is going to increase electricity demand. This is a reminder as we continue to debate the future of existing base load power. 
Globally, more electric cars are just a part of the massive increase in electricity consumption that will continue on for as far as our current models predict. Global electricity demand is expected to increase 1-3% to per year. So there you have it, what the greenies won't tell you about electric cars. And that's not all. How about this? Electric cars are still better for the environment, but lithium mining has some problems. According to this article, well, are they really better for the environment? Other regions of the world will suffer as humanity transitions to electric cars, specifically mining for lithium, the essential element for batteries used in many electric cars, as well as other portable electronics, is wreaking havoc on the world's deserts. Driven by a growing need for lithium to feed an insatiable tech sector. Lithium is found in the brine of salt flats. In order to obtain lithium, holes are drilled into the flats to pump the brine to the surface. This allows lithium carbonate to be extracted through a chemical process. Last week, Bloomberg published a report detailing how the boom in lithium mining is irreversibly destroying the local environment of northern Chile's Atacama Desert. Mining for lithium means removing large amounts of water, which means depleting the water supply for locals. The brine is pumped into evaporation pools to separate salt from the lithium, which floats to the surface. It's then chemically processed to produce powdered lithium carbonate. We're fooling ourselves if we call this sustainable and green mining, Christina Dorador, a Chilean biologist, told Bloomberg. The lithium fever should slow down because it's directly damaging salt flats, the ecosystem and local communities. <laughs> Did the greenies tell you that one? Given Bolivia's appalling track record on mine pollution and the quantity of chemicals needed to produce lithium carbonate, the price of progress may be very high indeed. But that's not all folks, wait, there's more. Nickel mining, the hidden environmental costs of electric cars. So while the greenies are jumping up and down talking about fossil fuels and how damaging they are and running around with anti-mining signs, the extradition of nickel mainly mined in Australia, Canada, Indonesia, Russia and the Philippines comes with environmental and health costs. As countries the world over legislate to phase out petrol and diesel cars, attention is turning to the environmental impact of mining the minerals needed for electric vehicle batteries. The lithium-ion batteries of Tesla, for example, are mostly made of nickel and graphite, with lithium itself merely the salt on the salad. Plumes of sulphur dioxide choking the skies, churned earth blanketed in cancerous dust, rivers running blood red and environmental campaigners have painted a grim picture of the nickel mines and smelters feeding the electric vehicle industry. But it's not just electric cars. What about 5G? We all know about the health concerns around 5G and also the global surveillance possibilities and restriction of freedom by use of 5G uh, when governments get control of it and everything is monitored. But what about the energy use? The 5G dilemma, more base stations, more antennas, less energy, question mark. 5G networks will likely consume more energy than 4G. But one expert says the problem may not be as bad as it seems. A lurking threat behind the promise of 5G delivering up to a thousand times as much data as today's networks is that 5G could also consume up to a thousand times more energy. Concerns over energy efficiency are beginning to show up at conferences about 5G developments. That was from October 2018 by the way. This article says experts believe that a 5G network will consume three and a half times as much electricity as 4G thanks to a combination of massive MIMO antennas, legacy networks in multiple bands and the massive proliferation of small cells. Here's an article in Forbes that says 5G may be holy grail for telecom but energy sector feels much anxiety over new network. 
while telecom giants are boasting faster unlimited wireless connectivity for their mobile phone users under the long-awaited fifth-generation wireless network, the energy industry is worried. Energy groups are warning regulators that a 5G rollout without securing adequate bandwidth for the sector could cause major harm to the nation's electric grid and critical infrastructure. Here we have an article at Panasonic.com, how renewable energy will power 5G mobile service. If we go down the article a bit, it says communications companies are looking to greener, more efficient energy grid and power technology as a critical path to staying competitive. Ericsson, in collaboration with Panasonic Corp of North America, has already begun trial deployment of a new sustainable energy-as-a-service solution to hundreds of sites across North America with plans to rapidly expand in 2018. Smart Sustainable Grid and Tower Technology. What is the Smart Sustainable Grid and Tower Technology? The advanced energy solution called Green Tower combines Panasonic lithium-ion batteries, which we've already talked about, and solar modules with site management software and big data analytics, providing an efficient way for mobile operators and tower companies to measure, monitor and maintain energy infrastructure. Second thing there, solar modules. Ah yes, solar, that renewable energy source. But hang on a minute, you need panels, solar panels. And what do you need in solar panels? You need silver. And if you have no silver, you've got to use copper, which doesn't conduct anywhere near as well as silver. And so silver is still by far the best. And even if it is copper, you've got to mine it. And how are you going to mine it? You need energy to mine the silver and the copper. How thoroughly do the green fanatics think through this First, stuff? You have to find them, mine them, and finally process them. Sounds pretty simple, right? The process of getting these minerals out of the ground is much more challenging than that. And without mining, we wouldn't have the many things we rely on every day. And silver is used in all the electronics as well that 5G will be utilising and silver is becoming more costly to extract from the ground because there is less of it that's easily available. So what about wind power? Surely that's an answer for our electricity needs. Well, that has its own share of problems. Once wind turbines are set up, of course, the wind is free electricity in a sense, and they are pretty cost effective, but there's a big downside, well more than one, but I'll just concentrate on one with wind power as well, and that is, this article sums it up, retiring worn out wind turbines could cost billions that nobody has. That's at energycentral.com, and it's talking about Texas, where the winds will theoretically blow forever. But the lifespan of a wind turbine power company, say, is between 20 and 25 years. Though in Europe they're saying uh, a lot of them don't even last that long. Most of the wind turbines operating within the United States have been put in place within the past 10 years. And in Texas most have been operational since 2005. Estimates put the teardown cost of a single modern wind turbine which can rise 250 to 500 feet above the ground at $200,000. With more than 50,000 wind turbines spinning in the United States, decommissioning costs are estimated at around $10 billion. Yeah, and recycling some parts can be done. For example, you can take the copper and so on out and recycle it and make money back that way. But the actual turbine blades themselves are a high-tech wonder of composite material which cannot be separated into its component materials and is worthless for recycling. They are not recyclable and they can't be sold. The landfills are going to be filled with blades in a matter of no time. And decommissioned blades can be anywhere from 100 to 300 feet long and they need to be cut up before being trucked away on specialised equipment, which of course costs money 
to the landfill and then the landfill has to try and deal with that amount of blades. So as you can see wind power is not such a simple solution long term either. Some might suggest nuclear energy as an alternative but there are a bunch of big problems for that too. Fukushima being an example when something can go wrong and with the number of nuclear plants around the world potentially massive disasters could occur as a result of problems there and dealing with the waste of course is always an issue. I don't want to go into nuclear power in here but to me it seems like a very dangerous alternative. The sustainable development goals are driven by the United Nations Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 and in other videos I've dealt with the climate change scam. I just want to add a couple more things to that here and the first I will look at is this one very quickly. Top New Zealand scientist describes global warming as pseudoscience. The widespread obsession with global warming climate change in opposition to all factual evidence is quite incredible, Dr David Kerr. David Kerr is a former Director General of New Zealand's Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. As such he would have been considered one of New Zealand's top scientists. He's been publishing on sea levels since the 1950s. Dr Kerr describes how local councils are ignoring scientific fact in order to satisfy an agenda imposed on them from above. No matter if scientists, engineers and local observers all indicate that the sea is not rising, even retreating, once a council has decided on a policy that assumes that the sea is rising, the council is immovable and makes decisions on zoning and building codes on that basis. Climate change has become an important international topic, one might almost say religion. It began life as global warming. Then there's this other article here, Climate Science's Myth Buster. It's time to be scientific about global warming, says climatologist Judith Curry. This particular person met Judith Curry at her home in Reno, Nevada. Curry is a true climatologist. She once headed the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology until she gave up on the academy so that she could express herself independently. Independence of mind and climatology have become incompatible, she says. She tells them, for example, that between 1910 and 1940 the planet warmed during a climate episode that resembles our own down to the degree. The warming can't be blamed on industry, she argues, because back then most of the carbon dioxide emissions from burning fossil fuels were small. In fact, Curry says, almost half of the warming observed in the 20th century came about in the first half of the century before carbon dioxide emissions became large. Natural factors thus had to be the cause. None of the climate scientists now working for the United Nations can explain this older trend, nor can these models explain why the climate suddenly cooled between 1950 and 1970, giving rise to widespread warnings about the onset of a new ice age. This brings us to why Curry left the world of the academy and government-funded research. Climatology has become a political party with totalitarian tendencies, she charges. If you don't support the UN consensus on human-caused global warming, if you express the slightest scepticism, you're a climate change denier, a stooge of Donald Trump, a quasi-fascist who must be banned from the scientific community. New findings from the United Nations offer a grim assessment of how off track the world is in combating climate change. The UN's annual emissions gap reports that it takes a look at the difference between the world's current path and the changes needed to meet the goals of the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. If you do not support the agenda of the United Nations and the Green Movement, you're a climate change denier and you have to be silenced. Unfortunately, that's where we fit. 
Folks, if you found this video helpful, please remember to give it a thumbs up and to make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel and also visit our website, a minute to midnight.com. And if you want to help by donating to us, you can do that at our website as well, and it'd be much appreciated. Thanks for watching, and please share the video.